Hello, everybody. My name is Michael Harkey. Welcome and thank you for joining us today. This webinar is Teaching Double O Double Q Parts 1 and 2. Wow, that rolls off your tongue more than I thought it would. Double U Double O Double Q Parts 1 and 2. And so I'd like to introduce to you our speaker, the Awareness Guru of Indiana, the man with 13 letters after his name, the keeper of security and the breaker of tech, Dan Hathaway. Dan? Thank you very much, Michael. Uh, breaker of tech definitely applied to me uh, this morning, didn't it? Um, I would like to uh, have today's shout out go to Stacy Hathaway, who's my wife, and she's also our primary pretext caller here at Infotex, and so she has a wealth of information in terms of what she sees on the front line, so to speak, as we're auditing our clients. And then also I'd like to uh, do a shout out to Matt Jolly, who has not only volunteered, or actually I think we volunteered him, uh, to participate in some role playing that we're gonna do with Stacy at the end of the um, movie that we create. Uh, but also, Matt's going to kind of play the uh, the kind of the punchline guy, the the guy that you know. What I mean, we you know scold when he doesn't answer questions the way he's supposed to answer them. So uh, definitely appreciate Stacy and Matt's help. Uh, you'll see what I mean as we get into the movie that you're going to hopefully be able to show to your users. I also want to take this last chance to remind everybody that on an annual basis, we have uh, different types of trend articles uh, as we move into the you know, year 2018. Uh, we believe that, you know, especially the trend of trends article, uh, the top seven trend articles um, would make good reading material for you when you get ready to start the technology planning season uh, and, you know, doing your risk assessment. They uh, can help kind of you know, make you aware of uh, all the different articles that are out there about the trends that we're facing as uh, information security officers of smaller organizations. Um, as Mike alluded to, this is a movie within a movie type webinar that we're doing today. And so uh, the agenda is I'll talk about pretext calls and, and why we believe that uh, pretext calling is a threat we need to address. Um, the way we address it is with asking out of wallet questions, double O W Q is not a very good acronym it's hard to say um you have to practice it a little bit mike mike really butchered it at the beginning of the uh webinar uh, i feel like on purpose just because really what we're talking about is the act of asking out of wallet questions a lot easier said than done and so at the bequest of a lot of our clients uh, we're going to try to make a movie that your users will be able to watch maybe as part of your normal awareness training or maybe if they fail a pretext call or a phishing call um, all depending on whether you like the movie or not, maybe it can be uh, used as a punitive tool, if not an awareness training tool. Um, and I uh, just wanna remind everybody, we are very proud of Sophia, the producer of these webinars, uh, who has created the Joe Iso character, really take, taken the character to the next level. Um, and, and so hopefully Joe Iso will be able to participate in our webinar today as well. What we have, here is a failure to educate our employees about the fact that people are now calling the bank. Uh, there's two different kinds of threats, and, and then of course there's our customers. And we need to be able to provide information to our customers like we always have, but we need to make sure that it's our customers we provide that information to. And unfortunately, nosy neighbors, family members that are wanting to spy on other family members or their parents or uh, what we see a lot is divorce litigants. Uh, we'll be calling the bank on a regular basis asking for or usually account balances. Um, though the impact is kind of low-ish, um, and the reason why I say ish is because I really would like to submit to you that we have kind of a drip, drip, drip of minor breaches going on with the fact that we're readily handing out account balances to people who really shouldn't get them. And so to me, over time, the impact of the low impact threat, uh, the nosy neighbors, the retail clerks, the divorce litigants is higher than low. I feel like it could actually spike up to high um, if it's happening a lot. But as importantly, there is another threat out there and that is the professional criminal that is populating databases so that once 
uh, it's clear that the commercial corporate account takeover attack vector is no longer lucrative, we can start implementing the personal account takeover attack vectors. And when I say we, I'm talking about the bad guys. Um, and so they're trying to figure out who has the money in America. They're trying to find information about customers so that they can uh, implement coordinated attacks. And as a matter of fact, when we look at social engineering as an attack vector, uh, you know, to me, pretext calling is really way up high in the risk level. And most people see our risk, you know, to us, you know, uh, 10, 11, 12, 13 is high risk. Um, and so, you know, spear phishing is definitely still a risk. The phishing of our customers is a little bit higher uh, just because the likelihood of them, you know, clicking on a link, I hope, is higher than the likelihood of our employees, even though the links are probably better crafted when they're sent to our employees. Um, but what I'm frightened about is the orchestrated attack. Uh, for black swan events, which, you know, we're hoping we stay off the radar of the Russian business network and other crime organizations, but if we end up on their radar, they're going to implement an attack against us using many different tools. And I'll, I'll, I'll talk about Zeus in the movie, um, which is an old fashioned tool, but I've got print screens for it. Um, but you know, the, the bottom line is, is that if, if the black swan event, if the impact of that goes above the one to five you know, rating scale, then orchestrated attacks should be on our radar and pretext calling can actually be an early detection, you know, precursor of trouble coming down the road um, in our in incident response uh, workshops and webinars. This is a slide from an incident response workshop and webinar where we talk about um, the need for awareness training to, to really feed our detect and response methodology. And you'll see double O W Q right there. It's kind of hard to fit out of all the questions anywhere. So we use that abbreviation a lot more than we would like to. Um, but this is just from the incident response perspective. The bottom line is, is that if we can, you know, be aware of the fact that, hey, people are calling asking questions. And, you know, I mean, they seem to be professional at it. They, they, they succeeded a few times and now we're, they're on our radar. Hey, maybe we can, you know, be aware of that black swan event before it even gets off the ground. We've learned over the years that if we're going to teach security practices, it's not just about handing them a policy and say, read this. You know, we really, especially with out of wallet questions, are going to have to show them what we mean by out of wallet questions. And so that's really the reason why we're going to do the movie within a movie is because we know that when we say, when we suggest to our clients that you should try role playing as a method of teaching your employees, well, that's a lot easier said than done. As we learned, because we've come up with some role playing um, that we're going to be showing um, in the movie within the movie. Uh, but last but not least, testing our employees, uh, and we're learning this with the phishing attack vector that you know a lot of us are using no before so we can test our employees more often. And what I like about that is that when we test them against a phishing attack vector, we're actually activating their awareness against all of the different social engineering types of attacks as well as the, the mistakes that we can make. So I love the fact that we're able to implement attacks on a regular basis against our employees um, in a manner where we're testing them. Uh, we've long, you know, philosophized about awareness training having really three different processes. Educating is where we provide the policy and procedure. Motivating is really when we help them understand why they need to learn what they need to learn and get into the habits and disciplines that they need to get into. And then we need to activate their awareness and, and activating their awareness is really, you know, what we do with testing, in my opinion, as well as the reminders that you might be sending out to your users on a regular basis. Motivating them, though, is hopefully going to be part of what this movie accomplishes, because hopefully we'll be able to help them realize that the threat is real. What I have noticed, though, is that unfortunately, a lot of our bank employees are very busy. And so when we describe the threat as, hey, there's, you know, crime organizations out there that might try and get information from us, not to mention the divorce litigants, a lot of our bank employees think, well, you know what, that's not really, you know, we're going to be, that's not going to happen here. I mean, I mean, people don't believe it's going to happen to us, unfortunately, until it does. And, and, and by the way, that's why most of our management team members never backed up their home computer system. 
until they lost all their data, right? And, and so once they realized, hey, it can happen here, then they learned how to get a backup system on their home computer, blah, blah, blah. And so following that concept, we believe that Im implementing ongoing pretext calling tests is something that you might want to talk to your auditors about. Because if you spread it out over the course of the whole year, now are we checking against what I feel the highest likelihood if you, if you looked at our risk assessment when I, you know, that came up in this webinar, um, you'll realize that, boy, if we're doing this against spear phishing, we should probably be doing it on pretext calling as well. Um, what I've also noticed is that if we can tell our management team members and our tellers and everybody else in the bank that's going to have to learn how to ask out of wallet questions, that every time you answer that phone, it could be a test. Now the likelihood is real to them. It went from, a, in their mind, a two, even though I was saying a five on a scale of one to eight, it just went to an eight. There is a real likelihood that I could be pretext called. I better learn how to ask out of wallet questions. And so our movie uh, that's within this movie, we will have a movie of this webinar out there, I hope you realize. And so if you missed our January webinar, there's a, there's a movie out there that basically is about providing board awareness training. And then within that movie is the movie that you could show to your board called Cyber uh, Security for the Board. Um, with this, the movie is how to, act, you know, how to provide out-of-wallet questions training. And then the movie within the movie is how to ask out of wallet questions. And so we're going to start with why. That's the motivating factor, we hope. Uh, we're going to, you know, bring in what uh, and define what we mean by out of wallet questions. And then we're going to talk about how to ask out of wallet questions. We'll, we'll share some tips, but really try to get right into the role playing that uh, we've arranged with uh, various members of our team. So what you need to realize is that we're making a movie here that we hope a lot of banks will share with their users. And so what I want you to know is that, first of all, we're gonna delay, we're gonna kind of go silent for a few seconds here before we start the movie, just so it's easier for Sophia to find where she needs to you know, do her editing. Uh, but then second of all, I reserve the right to do a second take. Um, if, if, uh, I, I, if I'm not liking the way the role playing is going, we might actually say cut, 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 and start over and so you, it, it might make it interesting because you get to watch us create a movie i don't know but i want to warn you about that in advance we can cut all that out um and then there will be a movie that you'll be able to show your users that'll hopefully not have you know errors or mistakes or whatever in it can i get um, a second shot a second take on the intro yeah uh so <laughs> what we're going to do here mike is we're going to go ahead and uh and, and by the way this i want to remind everybody i'm really excited about the whole joe iso component of this movie here um, but i'm going to go ahead and switch to the opening screen mic and then you can uh, uh let's wait a couple seconds and then you can do your introduction hello i'm michael harkey and i'd like to introduce a movie from the infotex awareness training series asking out of wallet questions without further ado let me introduce our speaker dan hadaway managing partner of infotex dan Thank you very much, Michael. And I would like to just invite everybody to the notion that we have some work to do when it comes to learning a control that only we can exercise. Uh, we need to learn how to ask what the regulators call out of wallet questions. And so our agenda today is we're just gonna talk, start right off the bat, why do we need to ask out of wallet questions? Uh, then we'll try to define what we mean by out of wallet questions. And then we're going to try to arm you with, you know, here's how we would go about asking out of wallet questions if we were in your shoes. And we'll, we'll end with some role playing so that you can see actually how it shouldn't work. And then we'll also do some role playing to show you how asking out of questions will hopefully work in your organization. So back in the year 2011, a new guidance came out that your information security officer, you know, had to get his or her arms around. And part of that guidance required the use of out of wallet questions to authenticate phone callers. And the reason why is because what the federal government, you know, who writes these guidances was noticing is that pretext calling or the act of calling a financial institution and asking for information that the person should not be getting 
was starting to rise as a valid social engineering attack vector. And so what's happening now is that bad guys, as well as our customers, are calling the bank or the credit union on a regular basis and asking for information that they shouldn't have unless we've confirmed that they actually are who they say they are. And so just to make sure we, you know, help you understand what pretext calling is, is that it is somebody calling under a false identity. And that person is trying to really commit a fraud. They might be trying to get, you know, the balance on a divorce litigant, or they might be trying to, you know, uh, uh, get information that they can use in an orchestrated attack against your bank or worse, against one of your customers. As a matter of fact, there's really three types of people that are calling your bank right now. Uh, there's the legitimate callers, our customers, vendors, you know, our family members, et cetera. And then there are the threats. Uh, one is kind of a low impact threat, meaning that, you know, if we do make a mistake and we give out a balance to a nosy neighbor, it, 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 it stinks because we've just breached somebody's privacy, but at least it's contained to only one person. Um, what we're also frightened about, though, is that we're noticing that if the bank is part of what's called an orchestrated attack, where a professional criminal or a crime organization has decided to target the bank, pretext calling is one of the first things they will do to gain information about the bank. What type of systems the bank is using? You know, is, are the bank employees well trained? Can I get a balance from the bank easily? If so, that's an indication to me that I might be able to raise the priority of this bank when it comes to the radar in terms of who I'm gonna to try to attack with the many different tools I can use now that are designed to attack American banks and credit unions. And as an example, these print screens are from 2006, by the way. And so I wanna make sure you realize that this is an old you know, attack vector. It's a, a tool called Zeus that's still available. It's substantially modernized there's various modules that are are built in and one of those modules by the way is a database that people are populating by calling banks and credit unions and asking them questions for which the answer should not be provided unless we confirm they are who they say they are and if we zoom in on this i just want to point out which is kind of interesting about zeus is that the actual application is in english but if you need help you're going to have to learn how to speak and read russian because this particular application was uh, published by the Russian Business Network, a crime organization that is very good at what they do, and they are helping people target American banks and credit unions. And so how do we thwart pretext calls? Well, that's the reason you're watching this movie is because we need to ask what the federal government calls out of wallet questions. We all used to call them out of pocket questions until that 2011 guidance called them out of wallet questions. And so what do we mean by out of wallet questions? Well, it's a question that asks for information that we have on our customers in our computer systems usually that can't be found in a wallet or purse or on social media. And so what we mean by that is that if we can, you know, ask somebody with a deposit account the amount of a recurring deposit or where a recurring deposit's coming from, um, or maybe the amount of the last deposit if there are no recurring deposits. That's information that's rather hard from somebody for somebody from you know Czechoslovakia or North Korea uh, to gather on us by you know finding you know a stolen wallet or purse or by you know analyzing social media. Um, if you know we're really trying to you know be on guard we need to recognize that information that can be found in a wallet purse or on social media includes that mother's maiden name um, it used to be mother's maiden name was a nice identifier that's why we got in the habit of asking it some of our uh, computer programs some of our you know teller systems actually will give us the ability to capture and 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 hold the mother's maiden name and I believe that the mother's maiden name is a good question to ask as long as we're also asking an out of wallet question because the mother's maiden name is not an out of wallet question. It's something that can be easily found on social media now. And so somebody from 
outside of our country or a bad guy or, you know, et cetera, can easily guess the mother's maiden name by looking at social media. Not to mention the fact that a divorce litigant already knows the mother's maiden name. Our nosy neighbor might already know the mother's maiden name, et cetera. Um, likewise, you know, account numbers on the check. So, you know, if we lost our wallet or our purse, we might have checks in there. Um, likewise, some people are still keeping their social security card, you know, in their wallet or purse. But more importantly, you can get social security number off the dark web pretty easily. And if it's an orchestrated attack, you're, you might already have that information. That might be why the bank is on the bad guy's radar. Um, and then finally, of course, you can go online and Google anybody's address or phone number nowadays. So these are questions that you should, you know, you can ask. I mean, obviously, we've got to start off with the account number just so we can bring the customer up to see what kind of bottle wallet questions we can ask. So I'm not saying you shouldn't ask these questions. I'm just saying that you have not asked an olive wallet question if you're asking for this information. Likewise, if you ask what day of the week is your recurring deposit, you're kind of giving the bad guy a uh, one in seven chance of get, guessing the answer. And really, it's a lot more of a probability of that because most of us are going to say Friday because that's when everybody gets paid, right? And so that's not a good out of law question. Uh, likewise, any yes, no questions or questions with, you know, only two answers, you know, 50% is good odds. So try to stay away from those kind of questions. And just keep in mind that you know you most of us have more than one branch. So if, if the caller fails to get the right question with us, they might go to a different branch and try to ask the question there. Or come call back later and try to get a different person at your branch. So, you know, if you're asking a question with I think so, or if somebody's answering a question with I think so, you know, that's another example of a bad out of wallet question. So how do we ask? out of wallet questions then? Well, first, what we've found, what we've seen in our own business is that you should start with three little words for your protection. You don't have to use those three words, to, but you need to start with the notion that what I'm going to do is for your protection. What we see happening is that if you start with for your protection, the customer are automatically starts cooperating with you instead of wondering what the heck, this has never happened before, especially if your bank's been failing pre-tax calling tests. That obviously means that maybe not everybody's used to being asked out of law questions when they call asking for balances or whatever. But you're gonna need to work with the customer to try to find the right question. And you can enlist the help of your customer. You, you can explain politely, our procedure is to ask a question where we can't find the answer in a wallet, a purse, or on social media. And the customer might say, well, you know, I, I have several loans with you, and then you can, you know, look for good questions if they're a loan customer or whatever. Um, but ultimately, you need to determine by looking at your computer screen what question is the best question. And the other ultimately is you need to do that without giving your caller any information. So let's just kind of talk about the do's and don'ts. Do try to slow down and recognize that, hey, this is an important policy. There's real reasons we have this in place. There's real risk here. And so, you know, especially at first, we're going to have to learn how to ask out a wallet questions, why we suggest maybe a role play. But then meanwhile, we see so many people just ignore the starting with the three little words, and then they wonder why the customer is upset after they've gotten into the details of the out of wallet question. We need to make sure the customer understands it's for their protection. And then the customer is going to need to gather their thoughts. Very often they're busy. Very often they're in the middle of the situation. That's why they need the balance. And so we need to help them gather their thoughts. And then we just need to remember that our job is to politely explain our procedures and then follow those procedures. What we should not do is allow the caller to talk us out of the policy. If the caller's 100 years old and have been doing business with the credit union since the day, you know, their father bought them the, you know, savings, you know, bond when they were five years old, 95 years is a lot of history that we want to protect. 
and it's for your protection that we need these questions answered before we can release the information. They're going to get frustrated, at least at first, and don't take that personally. They're busy people and you have to follow policy. Don't offer any question to the caller, or don't offer, I'm sorry, don't offer any information to the caller. You have to be careful with that. And you need to get used to saying, I'm sorry, but I cannot provide that information until we've verified your identity. If you have somebody that's starting to shoot questions at you. Keep in mind that legitimate customers will say, well, what kind of loan do I have there? What can I do? What phone number can you call me at or whatever? Um, but more often, the bad guys try to confuse you. And the people that shouldn't have the information are not worried about the relationship that the person whose identity they're trying to steal has with the bank. And so they might go very rude on you. And that should just help you feel more comfortable with the fact that this is why you should follow policy and procedures. But there's going to be a lot of times, hopefully not a lot, after our customers get used to this, but there will be times where we simply can't arrive at the right question to ask the question or ask the customer. And in those cases, we do have two last resort responses that we want you to keep in your arsenal and know that it is policy you must implement. The first one is, is to offer to call the customer back at the phone number that you have filed on your computer. Um, they, a bad guy might say, well, I'm at this number, call me here. No, we need to call them at a phone number that's in our computer system. A bad guy might say, oh, and what number is that? What number do you have? We can't tell them what number we have in our phone system without confirming their identity. Now, keep in mind, they're going to go you know, look them up and try to call the next branch, but that's why we all need to ask the out of wallet question. There very often might be times where we don't have the right phone number in our system or where they happen to be in a cell-free zone or, you know, whatever, or out of the country and they're not using their cell phone or who knows. But that's because, you know, they are not used to having to answer out of wallet questions. And therefore, we have to go with last resort number two, which is to politely suggest the customer come into the branch to identify themselves. Now, a lot of you'll need to ask your supervisor. Some institutions want you to implement last resort number one and last resort number two. And if the customer is complaining still, then escalate to the branch manager or whoever would be the next person in line to escalate to. Some organizations would rather you try last resort number one and then escalate the supervisor and allow the supervisor to implement last resort number two. It all depends on your branch. You want to make sure your supervisor and you have that worked out. What I'd like to do now then is to introduce um, the people that we're going to do some role playing with. And uh, first of all, what we've uh, done is we've invited one of our pretext callers. Uh, her name is Stacy. Say hi, Stacy. Hello. And Stacy is a person that works for Infotex, the makers of this movie. And what she does uh, for her job is she calls our clients as part of an audit or as part of what we call ongoing pretext calling, where we'll call our clients on an on, on all year round basis. And she asks for information that you should not be giving her. Um, she's mimicking an attack. And then we you know, take the results to our clients and help them uh, learn how to uh, ask out of wallet questions. Um, I'm also though very proud, if, if you watch, or if you, if you get like the Ohio Record or Who's Your Banker Magazine or you know, one of the local you know, banking uh, trade magazines here, uh, you might recognize the next person that we're going to be using. Uh, he's uh, very, very uh, uh, good at, at all of our information security controls that we suggest. Uh, but we've been running this ad campaign about Joe Iso. And so uh, it's kind of a risk for hey, Joe Dan. to uh, come and join us today. Hey, Dan. Yeah, Mike? Um, yeah, Joe can't help with this because um, he's not real. He's not real? Yeah, can't help with this one. Oh, okay. I didn't realize that. I mean, that, that makes sense. Uh, I knew that while I was Drew Major. I, I think I might have been pretext called. <laughs> so, okay. Well, 
well, hey, um, for at least for the sake of this movie, then let's just go ahead and um, uh, Mike is, is uh, Matt Jolly in the audience? He sure is. Hey, did somebody say my name? Hey, Matt, how are you doing this morning? Hey, I'm doing all right. You got anything going on? Uh, well, you know, I kind of have my breakfast laid out here, and I was going to kind of get into that while I was listening along uh, to the webinar. Yeah, that's cool. That's cool. I appreciate you coming to the webinar, by the way. And, and by the way, just so you know, I still owe you that lunch. Matter oh, fact, awesome. Maybe we can go out to lunch sometime this week. Hey, that works out for me. But, um, hey, I was wondering, uh, we need to do some role playing here. And, and so I was wondering, would you uh, mind kind of playing the part of a teller in a bank? Oh, well, you know, my breakfast might get cold and uh, I was really that just... You know, great, Matt. I love it. The one thing I love about Matt, here's a guy who's going places, by the way, because he always volunteers for um, pretty much everything we ask him to volunteer for. Um, and so, um, uh, Matt, uh, we're going to, do you, um, you got to put on your teller hat, okay? Uh, all right. I'm going to play the part of a teller in, a, in kind of a scenario, a uh, role-playing thing here, okay? And, and just so you know, since Matt always volunteers, we do have his picture ready. This is Matt here. And so, um, Matt and Stacy will be doing our pretext calling role-playing here. I, I would also like to say that the way we've set this up, is that Stacy's going to play two different characters for the first three calls? She's going to um, kind of play the part of a bad guy, and then for the last two calls, she's going to play the part of a real customer. And, and the reason for this is because we want to make sure that people. Um, by the way, there's the, the part of the bad guy. We we call her Scary Stacy. I mean, think about it. Uh, we work with somebody who's makes a living by lying. Um, but the first three scenes are going to kind of demonstrate, you know, how not to ask out of law questions. And then the last two scenes, Stacy will be playing the real Stacy, where we demonstrate how we feel a real pretext call should go. Or actually not a real pretext call, a real call with a real customer should go. So um, I feel like, uh, just so you know, this might be one of those takes where I feel like we need to redo that. So I'm gonna pause by about five seconds. Sorry about that. Okay, make that two seconds. So Stacy is actually gonna play the part of two different callers. For the first three scenes, Stacy's playing the part of St scary Stacy. Uh, we're all kind of a little bit weirded out about the fact that we have somebody we work with that's so good at lying. Um, but then for the last two calls, Stacy will play a real customer. And, and the reason why is for the first three scenes, we want you to see, you know, what it looks like when we're not asking out of wallet questions. And then the last two scenes is when Matt will be asking the right out of wallet questions. And so uh, the other thing to know is whenever we use a fake bank at Infotex, we, we use the first bank of nowhere. And so we're going to be pretending like Matt works at the First Bank of Nowhere. And then we just want Matt and Stacy to read these scenes. And this is really as simple as it can be. Again, I wouldn't want you to read scenes one through three because this is how not to ask out of law questions. But once we get to scene four and five, I think you'll see what I mean. So Stacy, are you ready? Yes, I am. Okay, you can go ahead and get started. Okay, great. Stacy calls the First Bank of Nowhere. Thanks for calling the First Bank of Nowhere. This is Matt speaking. Hi, Mr. Speaking. I need the balance on my checking account. I'd love to be able to help you with that. Uh, can I get your name and account number? Sure. My name is Stacy Hadaway, and my account number is 11223344. Awesome. And can you give me your mother's maiden name? Yes, my mother's maiden name is Cooper. Uh, all righty. It is uh, showing here that your balance is $2,352.27. Awesome. So that's $2,352.27? Uh, that's correct. 
Great. Thanks so much. Uh, you're very welcome. Have a good day. Thanks. Matt, Matt, Matt. Were you listening to the beginning of our webinar here? Uh, well, you know, I was. I thought I was paying pretty good attention. Well, what do you think was wrong with maybe the scene here? Uh, well, uh, now that I'm now that I'm looking over it a second time, I'm guessing that uh, the mother's maiden name is not a very good question to ask. I I, I agree with you there, Matt. And Stacy, why is that? Because I can easily find the mother's maiden name through social media. And do you do that very often when you're pretext calling? Uh, yes, I do. Yes. What, what would you say? I mean, about how many times do you believe uh, people rely solely on the mother's maiden name when it comes to the failed pretext calls? Um, I would say that, you know, that happens quite often. I would say about 60 to 60% 60 of the time. Okay. And so sometimes they're asking for mother's maiden name, but then they ask an additional out of law question. But what I'm hearing you say is that six out of every 10 times somebody fails, they're relying on the mother's maiden name. Yeah, usually. Wow. Yeah, that's wow. Yeah. So let's see here. Uh, what do you think Stacy looks like after this call? Yep, yep, yep. That's what I was afraid of. Uh, we do not want people doing this after they call our organization, okay? And if we do, then yeah. Yeah, then that's just kind of the way Matt looks after we so so who won this, Mike? Well, Mike's not paying attention apparently, but uh <laughs> I had to, sorry, I was muted. I say Stacy won. Yeah, you're mm -hmm. muted. Yeah, I obviously Stacy won. I will take that who 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 won this part out of the movie, Sophia. Um but yeah, let's try it again. So who won this one, Mike? I'd say Stacy won. Yeah, I feel like, you know, unfortunately, there's winners and losers when it comes to pretext calling tests. And yeah, we, we, we've got Stacy, you know, just ready to high five somebody. And Matt's kind of looking a little bit sick about what he did. Well, let's, let's go ahead and try a um, next scene here. And two, uh, scene two stretches two different slides here. So I'll try to move the slide when it's time. Uh, but Stacy, are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. Go ahead and give her a start. Okay, great. Stacy calls the first bank of nowhere. Thanks for calling the First Bank of Nowhere. This is Matt speaking. Hello, Mr. Speaking. I need that balance on my checking account. Uh, sure. Uh, can I get the number on that account, please? Um, yeah, my account number is 123456. Uh, okay. And uh, can I also get your Social Security number, please? Yeah, it's uh, 213-548962. Uh, are you sure that it's not five 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 one two five two one two? Can you say that again? Uh, we are showing your social security number as five 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 one two five two one two. No, and the last time I called, you guys said you you guys still had the wrong social security number on file. Oh, well, I do apologize for that, and uh, I'll be happy to give you your account balance here. Uh, it looks like it is $1,240.59. Uh, additionally, I can update that number for you. What was it again? Okay. Um, well, first, my account balance is $1,240.59. Uh, that is correct. Okay, great. All right. So my social security number is 213-548666. Uh, okay, I've got that uh, down. I will update that later. Uh, thanks for getting a hold of us. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Uh, no problem. Bye. Oh, my goodness. Stacy, does this actually ever happen in real pretext calling? Yes, this has actually happened uh, a few times. Wow. And so I imagine what you had to do then is call back and talk to the whoever we're working with at the audit. Yes, yeah, I definitely call them right back. And so what happened here, Matt? 
Uh, well, I tried to verify their identity, and they gave me the incorrect information, and then I turned around and gave out the information anyways. <laughs> yeah, and then he also gave them the right social security number. <laughs> uh, and then I updated our system with the uh, number that they gave me. <laughs> and so now when Stacy calls back, she's going to have to decide which social security number to provide. <laughs> Oh, yeah, it could get confusing. I wonder what Stacy looks like after a call like this. Yeah, that's what I was afraid of. <laughs> kind of arrogant, if you ask me. Yeah. Matt, if you don't start learning how to ask out of wall questions, boy, I, the customers are going to start wondering about us, right? Yeah, that was pretty embarrassing. <laughs> well, let's say that somebody taught you how to ask got a lot of questions let's let's try uh the the next scene stacy it's another one that's a two-parter okay stacy calls the first bank of nowhere uh thank you for calling the first bank of nowhere this is matt speaking hi matt speaking i need the balance on my checking account uh sure thing uh, can i get your account number please yeah it's uh one two three four five six seven eight Ah, uh, okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, could you tell me the date of your last deposit? Yeah, it was last Friday. Uh, okay, and about how much was that deposit for? I, I don't know. My husband reconciles our account. I'm just making sure we don't overdraft anything. Oh, well, you don't have to worry about that. Uh, I think your account is fine. Uh, the balance right now is $685.12. Okay, so the balance is six eighty five twelve. Oh, that is correct. Awesome. Thanks so much. Ah, no problem. Have a nice day. Thanks, you too. Oh my goodness, Matt, what happened here? Well, uh, I, I made another attempt. I asked a question, and they got part of it right. <laughs> But honestly, I think that uh, somebody could have probably guessed that the last deposit was going to be on a Friday and they'd have a decent chance of that uh, being true. Well, and that's why I see you asked the follow up question. That was good. But Stacy, do, do you ever have this happen when you're pretext calling financial institutions where, you know, they, they ask the right questions, you don't give them the right answer and they go ahead and give you the balance anyway? Yes, this happens a lot. Wow. And so what is it? Are, is it, Matt, are you worried about being rude? Uh, yeah, I, I would say so. I, you know, I don't want a, an angry customer to call back maybe and then complain to my boss that I was rude to them. And uh, I just, uh, I just want to make them happy and then get on with the, uh, the next customer. Well, I get that, but what we need to remember is that your job is not to be polite as much as it is to politely explain our procedures and then follow those procedures. So uh, what I'd like to make sure everybody in the audience knows is that we're now going to switch to a new scenario. But before we do, I guess we got to let Stacy celebrate a little bit there. And, and Matt, you know, you got to start following policy. I mean, now you're demonstrating that you know the policy, but you're not following it. That's, that must look really terrible in the, the pretext calling journals when people do that. But I get it. They're, they're wanting to be polite. But let's show people what it looks like when we politely follow procedures um, with our scene four. And so everybody remember now Stacy isn't scary, Stacy. Stacy's a real customer calling <laughs> the first bank of nowhere. Stacy? Okay. Uh, Stacy calls the First Bank of Nowhere. Thanks for calling the First Bank of Nowhere. This is Matt speaking. Hi, I need the balance on my checking account. Oh, sure. I'd love to help you with that. But first, uh, for your protection, I'm going to need to ask you a few questions just to verify who I'm speaking with. Uh, could I get your account number, please? Yeah, it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Uh, okay, and uh, when was the date of your last deposit? It was last Friday. Uh, okay, and uh, could you tell me about how much that deposit was for? 
I, I don't know. My husband reconciles our account. I just want to make sure that we don't overdraft anything. Uh, okay, no problem. Uh, could you tell me where the deposit came from at least? Yeah, it came from Acme Corporation. Uh, okay, uh, just uh, one last thing. I see that you recently wrote a check for more than $1,000. Could you tell me who that check was written to? Are you talking about the $1,200 check written to Mary Maid? Uh, yes, I am. And thank you for verifying your identity with us. And I can now tell you that your balance is $23. Awesome. Thanks so much. I appreciate it. Uh, no problem. Have a good day. Thank you, too. Well, how about that? Matt, do you feel like you were being rude? Uh, no, I think that uh, once I let him know that I was doing this to, to protect their information, that uh, it really helped. Uh, yeah, I, I feel like the three little words for your protection really go a long way to establish, you know, what you're going to be doing. I wonder, you know, I, I feel like after that one, Matt probably, yeah, that's what I thought. Matt looks pretty good. You're feeling pretty good, Matt? Yeah, I'm feeling pretty good. You know, he's a man. I feel like this looks like a man who's going places. Stacy, on the other hand, I don't know. What, does, what do you think Stacy's thinking? That was interesting, but at least first Bank of Nowhere has my back. <laughs> Thank you very much, Stacy. Let's try one more scene. Okay, let's, this is another scene where Stacy's a real customer. And this is another scene where hopefully Matt will follow policy. Stacy? Okay, um, Stacy calls the First Bank of Nowhere. Uh, thanks for calling the First Bank of Nowhere. This is Matt speaking. Hi, um, I need the balance on my checking account. Uh, sure, I'd love to help you with that. Uh, but first, for your protection, I'm going to need to ask you a few questions just to verify who I'm speaking with. Uh, can I get your account number, please? Sure, it's 11223344. Uh, all righty, and can you tell me the date of your last deposit? It was last Friday. Uh, okay, and about how much was that deposit for? I don't know. My husband reconciles our account. Uh, okay, uh, could you tell me uh, where the deposit came from? Yeah, it came from Flora Plumbing. Uh, okay, and uh, additionally, I see that you wrote a check for more than $1,000 in the past week, uh, and it was to an individual. Can you say who that it was written to? Um, are you talking about the $1,200 check to Mary made? Uh, no, I am showing that a couple of weeks ago. I'm talking about a check that was written within the past week. Hmm. I know my husband works with this one guy. I just can't remember his name. Uh, well, ma'am, I do apologize, but as you can tell, I'm having a hard time confirming your identity. Uh, is there a chance that I can call you back at the phone number that we've got listed on file? Um, can you tell me which phone number you have? Uh, I'm afraid I'm not allowed to give out that information to somebody that hasn't been authenticated. Uh, I can tell you that it is a local cell phone prefix. Uh, would that be your number? Well, my cell phone number is 555-1212. Uh, okay, unfortunately, that's not the number that we have on file for you. Uh, could Would you mind coming into a branch with your identification to get your account information? No, I don't mind. I can come in today. How late are you guys open? Uh, we're open until 5 p.m. Well, holy cow, we're going to have somebody come into the branch? I don't know. Did that come off as rude to you, Stacy? No, not at all. And I really like, actually, you know, we started off answering the questions a little bit, right? But, boy, that was an easy question. You know, we that the when was the last deposit? Last Friday is a real easy, you know, probably a 40%, if not a 50% chance of guessing. Um, but then, you know, Stacy was not able to answer the rest of the out of wallet questions. And so we did try the last resort number one, which is to call back at the number on file. And when that didn't work in this particular institution, 
Matt as the teller did not have to escalate to the supervisor unless Stacy seemed upset and she didn't. And so I'm, I'm, I'm feeling like this is a good scene that addresses a lot of the issues. Of course, additional scenes that might need to be exercised on, on any institution would be, you know, a loan customer calling that doesn't have the deposit call, account, that sort of thing. Uh, Matt definitely looks like somebody who's going somewhere. Good job, Matt. Oh, thank you. And before I forget, I definitely appreciate you joining uh, the webinar today. And I, 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 again, thank you for volunteering. And uh, definitely, we need to get that lunch in sometime this year. Oh, sure. Just uh, get at me on Slack and we'll work it out. Meanwhile, I wonder what Stacy, the customer, looks like right now because she has to come into the branch. Hmm. She looks kind of thoughtful. I wonder what she's thinking. Wow. Life in the 21st century. Oh, well, at least the first bank of nowhere has my back. Okay, now I'm pretty sure a lot of you are probably saying, hey, wait, 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 that isn't really the way it works. You know, our customers sometimes are frustrated with us. Sometimes our customers are, you know, irritated. And by the way, I again want to make sure I thank Stacy and Matt uh, for helping us with this movie. And um, let's just to summarize by saying we realize that it's easier said than done. We realize that some of your customers are going to be frustrated. But we also know that they were frustrated the first time, you know, they had to use strong passwords on their internet banking system. But once they realized it was for their protection, they learned how to use strong passwords. And so uh, we believe you're going to have to practice in order to learn the best way for you. But know that when we find a bank that has issues with uh, asking out of wallet questions, that's kind of a precursor of, hey, there's bigger issues in your awareness training program. Um, you know, it's easy to test pretext calling. It's easy to, you know, uh, to, you know, be on the radar if you're not following that procedure. But if we don't know how to ask out of law questions, you know, what other controls that we're supposed to implement do we not know how to use? Uh, meanwhile, after time, we believe your customers will get used to this. I know I'm running into this when I uh, try calling my institutions for information. Um, Stacy, have you run into this before where, you know, maybe the credit card company or the company we deal with, you know, the bank we're dealing with are asking out of wallet questions? Uh, yes, definitely. And yeah. so it is a control that's going to become more and more accepted by your customers. We feel like there'll be a tipping point where your customers will start wondering why you didn't properly authenticate them if they call asking for information. And I also know the loan officer always ends up, and for good reason, saying, well, what about the customer? I'm working with the guy all day long. You know, I can see, you know, confirming his identity maybe on the first call, but do I have to confirm it every single time the guy calls me back? And our answer to that is, you know, first of all, you know, let's check the policy. Either maybe the financial institution already has a policy about that, but we believe that your you know, charged with a lot more important judgments to make as a loan officer. So we believe that your judgment is uh, best in that type of situation, but we still need you to know how to ask out of wallet questions for that loan customer that calls you three years later and you don't recognize their voice. And I guess the way I'd like to leave it is that in every instance of when you're supposed to enforce controls that inconvenience our customers and I'll grant you out of wallet questions are definitely one of those instances but your job is instead of just being polite to politely explain procedure um, when I'm involved in social engineering attacks it's usually physical breach attempts against larger organizations and when I succeed the person that I just you know made look bad in our report unfortunately well, I always say I was just trying to be polite. That's not your job. Your job is to politely explain procedure and then follow those procedures. So I'd like to thank you for spending this time watching this movie with us. Um, I hope that if you uh, are supposed to provide a code to your information security officer or whomever you saw that was when we introduced Matt and Joe and Stacy in the movie, you can go back to that if you need to get that code. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Dan. Um, I'd like to. Now we're back to 
through the regular webinar. I see we're running into some time issues. I have a few more things to go over quickly. Um, first of all, one of the things we, you know, see people doing with that movie, once we get it boiled down and take out the part where we had to take, take two and that sort of thing, um, is, you know, you might be able to bring this up in your awareness training or maybe send a link to it. It's going to be on tour.infotex.com. Uh, some of our clients have said that, hey, I'm going to use that. I don't care how bad it is. I'm going to make the people that fail our darn social engineering test watch your movie. Um, and there is a code. Um, if you saw it, it's Blueberry down in a little corner when we're introducing Matt, Stacy, and Joe Iso. Um, and uh, one of the things, we're not sure if the code word is a good idea or not. One of our clients brought up that we could do that. And so we decided to put it in there in case you want to use it. Um, but what we really recommend you do is to follow up this movie with a comprehension quiz. And so I just want to really quickly show you, it's one of our boilerplate, so you know we have a transfer of copyright agreement in it. Um, and uh, this is actually the first iteration of it. I think we need to change that. That was left from the last iteration of another comprehension quiz that we did. But what I want to, uh, this is all self-explanatory in my opinion, uh, but I still wanted to kind of zoom in on a couple of the questions. Uh, first of all, I'm not sure if this is important up here or if you're going to use the code word, uh, but question number seven in our comprehension quiz, and this is free with the webinar, so I'm hoping Mike is actually providing this to your Sophia or whoever, um, but this is the one really where, um, you know, this is a decision that you need to make as an institution, you know, do we want to give our loan officers cover from a policy perspective that, yeah, you know, I recognize the voice because I've talked to them five times today. And so you might need to adjust your policy if you want to provide for that. Um, another thing uh, policy-wise that is, a, is something that you need to think about is, do we want to auto, always require the um, last resort number two, you know, that I'm sorry, you'll have to come into branch. Do we want our tellers making that decision? Or do we want to escalate that to a shift manager or a branch manager or whatever? Um, and so I hope that you uh, realize that as it is a boilerplate, it's a starting point. It's not perfect. You know, you might want to look at every one of those questions. There is a key in the back. I, I forgot I was supposed to show that as well. But um, uh, just suffice it to say that the, the answers we think are the right answers have been uh, highlighted in, uh, you know, at the end of that uh, comprehension exercise. And so what you don't want to do is just send a whole Word document because you'll be sending the key with it. Um, so you want to make sure you take that key out. Uh, when you provide that comprehension exercise to your employees. And then what we also believe is that you should make sure they answer every question right before they're left off the, you know, let off the hook. Um, especially if you're using the uh, movie and the comprehension quiz for punitive reasons, you know, they, they failed the pretext call. Well, make sure they're answering every question right. If they don't, you know, make them retake the quiz until they answer every question right after you've told them, of course, what the right answer is. Um, and again, it's a starting point, like all our boilerplates, we're not saying it's perfect. Uh, we're saying that, you know, you need to take a look at it and customize it to your organization. Thank you again for attending and everybody have a great day. When you view an Infotex webinar or movie, you do so with four caveats. First, you're agreeing to the terms posted at the web page listed on this slide. Second, our lawyers want you to know that what Infotex presents is often time dated or about new trends, regulations, or guidance, and therefore we cannot provide this material with any warranty whatsoever. Thirdly, material provided with Infotex webinars and movies is copyrighted. You keep the copyright to material customized to your organization, but Infotex reserves the right to use the material in other engagements and boilerplates. See our transfer of copyright agreement at the webpage listed in this slide. Finally, those who view our webinars or movies may be added to an email mailing list. If you do not wish to receive notice of additional educational opportunities, please accept our apologies and please opt out at the webpage shown on this slide.